Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for our U.S. and global participants. Welcome to the second day of Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, the Air and Space Innovation Program. My name is Asher Kotz. I run the Cybersecurity Outreach Program and manage our office in Tel Aviv, Israel. A three-part series provides a unique platform, we believe, for an exciting, engaging, and informative opportunity to hear about the latest and greatest in emerging technology in air and space RA segment, as well as to get more familiar with the significant player and asset here in Northern Virginia market. Just a few words about Fairfax County. You can see the picture uh, behind me. This is in Tyson Corner, the business hub for Northern Virginia. In a clear day, you can see the Washington Monument. It's mean we are very close to Washington DC, the seat of the federal uh, power, which represent the largest customer in the world. On the West, we have the international airport, Washington Dallas, that brings multiple flights from all over the world in a regular year and a multiple flight to the US. We have several strong sectors, including, of course, the air, space, and defense sector, cyber, the whole uh, ecosystem for data center and cloud. We got Amazon in Arlington. We got Amazon Web Services in the Western side. And in between, it's a very, very strong technology sector in the US. And we believe that actually one of the strongest in the East Coast. Before we begin, as a reminder, let's talk about our platform UVA, the event that we are using it today. All the event agenda and speaker is right there on the platform. And I hope you had the opportunity to network with your peers before the event. At the end of the event, at around 10.35 a.m. Eastern time course, we will have about 30 minutes opportunity to network and talk to the speakers via a video chat. We can, you can also submit your question during the program at the Q&A sessions. Today's program brings us a forward thinking and breakthrough in space innovation from technology to accelerate data navigation and low orbiting si uh, satellite system to the challenges of a long-term and distance range of space exploration. We have speakers from industry, publication, NASA, and innovative companies. Therefore, it is my great pleasure to start today's program with an opening keynote addressed by Dan Dumbacher, the executive director of the American Institution of Aeronautics and Astronautics right here in Reston. Before Dan joined the AIAA staff about two years ago, actually three years ago in January, 2018, Dan was the professor in engineering practice at Purdue University. Mr. Dumbacher served as the deputy associate administrator at NASA headquarters at the Exploration System Development Division, Human Exploration and Operation Missions Director. As a program director of NASA, then managed the Space Launch System, the Orion, and Ground System Development and Operations effort. He led a national team of 5,000 members and when responsible and was responsible for three billion annual budget. Then the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Asher. Greatly appreciate that introduction and good morning to everyone. And thank you for having us here. I'm Dan Dumbacher, as Asher said, the executive director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I'm pleased to open the focus session today on space innovation. You are going to hear from some of the people who are developing and advancing the latest innovative technologies in space for commercial and defense applications from right here in Fairfax County in Northern Virginia. I would like to spend a few minutes with you talking about commercial space trends, what we'll see in space in the near term and how we can continue pushing our frontiers further. If we could go to the next slide, please. 
If we take a quick look at the entire global space economy today, it shows at about 360, 70 billion. Most of it dominated by the satellite industry at 270 billion. Those are the slices of pie here that are in the blue, the purple, and the green. Of course, this includes all manner of satellites, TV, radio, broadband, commercial remote sensing and navigation, along with the associated ground equipment, the manufacturing of the satellites and the launch services. The non-satellite industry dollars at just over 95 billion, and they are shown in the red, brown, tan and beige. These non-satellite industry dollars include government budgets of the US and other countries and how those dollars are spent on science, exploration, space operations, safety and security and other endeavors. Even looking at 2019 dollars, it's a big pie, but it could be bigger. And we'll talk about more of that later. If you could go to the next slide. In terms of trends and what we see emerging, here are some key points. A growing number of satellites and mega constellations are being uh, put into orbit. The, sat the size of the satellites is shrinking. More of the satellites, with all of these satellites, we have an increased need for cybersecurity and an ever increasing need for space traffic management. Cost to orbit is decreasing, greatly aiding the economic equation. Launch vehicle options are multiplying with micro launchers, light to medium and heavy lift vehicles. And startup companies are attracting large amounts of capital investment. Spaceports are being planned and developed around the world. And the possibilities of private space stations are actually coming true. The government is becoming more like a true customer of civil space. And the public private, excuse me, the public private partnerships are fueling this progress. It's clear that space is a very busy place. If we go to the next slide, looking back at 2020, we can see a snapshot of commercial space activity through October. 12 of 85 launches are characterized as commercial and 971 of the 1,085 satellites launched were commercial. Just look at the explosion of the spacecraft launched in the last few years in the bar graph on the middle of the slide. Quite a growth in recent history. We appreciate this data from one of our AIAA corporate sponsors, corporate members, Bryce Space and Technology. Looking ahead, 2021 will continue to be busy. We go to the next slide. It lists some of the activities coming up in 2021. Certainly not all of them by any stretch, but we have missions to Mars from around the world. This is actually the year of arrival at Mars. Reaching the moon, we are getting people back and forth to the International Space Station, sending probes deep into space and testing all the new launch capabilities that need to be put in place. Many satellites are planned for 2021 as well. Just last week, SpaceX launched 143 satellites on a rideshare mission, breaking the record for the most satellites sent to orbit on a single launch. That level of creativity is going to continue to propel small sap growth and drive innovation in launch vehicle capabilities. Space means business and space is busy. A Next slide, please. AIAA helps our members through this busy, busy business of space. We serve 30,000 individual members and nearly 100 corporate members as the world's largest aerospace professional society. Our goal is simple, to help aerospace professionals and their organizations succeed. We do that through forums, events, publications, and educational programs that advance and exchange the ideas and technical knowledge. You will hear from one of our corporate members today during the panel discussion, Ball Aerospace, as well as OneWeb, who has been part of our recent SciTech forum. That's why it's so exciting for us to be part of this event, to see and hear our members and other active companies to share their progress and hear their plans for the future. If we go to the next slide, AIAA believes that we are all working in this together with our members and everyone. We are shaping the future of aerospace and it's a bold future. We are leading humanity beyond planet Earth, defining the next century of flight and creating the world we dream of. We see an off-world future, extending the human neighborhood that's being assembled today 
based on the building blocks of launch capability, off-world outposts, and interest from adjacent collaborating industry partners. Next slide, please. How are we going to get such an off-world future and extend the human neighborhood? It takes all of us to extend this neighborhood to low Earth orbit, to the moon, and beyond. AIAA and about 3,000 attendees just spent several days in November discussing all of this at our ASCEND event. ASCEND stands for Accelerating Space Commerce, Exploration, and New Discovery. It's apparent that we will commercialize and settle space through the will and persistence of passionate stakeholders like you. Further exploration and settlement of space will be driven by private commercial companies and by NASA and the other government space agencies. Some of those companies may be well established, others are startups today, and new companies will emerge. Adjacent industries and communities will be key and we must make it attractive and profitable if we are all to grow the space economy. You can join the conversation at our next Ascendex Summit in March. We will be discussing how to teach, nurture, and inspire the next generation workforce. Every quarter this year, we'll host targeted events that build toward the next annual event in November. Next slide, please. In conclusion, recently, one of our industry leaders, David Thompson, former CEO and founder of Orbital ATK, said, quote, in any industry that is dynamic and any market that is efficient, we need both the bulls and the bears, the optimists, the pessimists, and those in between. David is cautious about the next three to five years, yet, quote, looking 10 years and beyond, it's likely that new applications, new technologies, and new economics will reinvigorate space commerce, and over the long term, it will serve to benefit, serve to the benefit of all the people, the enterprises, and the countries on Earth. On behalf of AIAA, I look forward to these next years working alongside you to bring these dreams to reality. Thank you for your time and attention today. Asher, thank you for allowing us to be here. And we look forward to a great conversation. Asher, back to you. Dan, thank you very much. It's very exciting to see uh, your perspective, hey, uh, what you currently do, but the fact that you came from NASA. So we have actually, I can say a little NASA club here, including yourself, Dr. Uliad Peretz, and Ms. Katrin, a leader. So let's move to the next segment. Speaking which is, the next segment is a panel to talk about new technology and space application. The presenter on your screen will walk you through their innovation, concept, and technology, plus the business model, how to make some revenue and some money of this really, really growing uh, technology sector, which I read sometime maybe a trillion dollar in the next few years per year. So it is my great delight to introduce our moderator for this panel. You can see his picture on the screen, Dr. Eliad Peretz. Eliad works at NASA Gadar Space Flight Center and serve as a lead researcher for new space missions. He has a very unique role. Eliad is responsible with identifying and mapping the scientists' challenges and identifying the required technologies from some of NASA very, very essential space missions. For his work, Eliad got the NASA Space Technology Research Award and the Gardar Honor Award. By the way, Eliad has the a, a academic degrees from Cornell and from the Technion in Israel, which serve very well in his current role. Eliad, take it away, please. Thank you. Can you hear me well, Asha? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you, Ashen, for your introduction and kind words. And thank you, Dan, for your opening remarks. It is my great, my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the second day of the Air and Space Innovation Series. Today, we are highlighting space innovation. Our panel will be focusing on new technologies for space applications. I would also like to thank the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority for the invitation and I'm excited to open the excellent panel we assembled here today. I would like to start with a short introduction of our panel members. Each member will have two minutes to introduce themselves and tell us about their current position. 
Um, I will start with Gil Shacham, the VP of Marketing and Product at Satisfy. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Gil, uh, originally from Israel. I'm about 25 years in the uh, telecom business, uh, mostly satellite communications, wireless, cellular, Wi-Fi, WiMAX. I'm working in Satisfy for the past eight years. It's a startup based in uh, Israel and the UK, and now starting our business in the US as well. Uh, we have uh, started from ground infrastructure, developing the holy grail of satellite communications, which is electronically steering antennas, and high bandwidth modems. And we are now moving uh, in the last couple of years to satellite payloads. So uh, transparent and regenerative processors, digital beamforming networks, and actually doing what startups do, uh, but in space. Uh, we have uh, in-house capabilities for developing silicon technologies and product. And we are, uh, maybe considering the new space area, but uh, we're trying to build things also with taking old space uh, into consideration. Great, thank you, Gil. Next, we have Eric Ingram, the CEO of Scout. Floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, so hello, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Eric Ingram. I'm the CEO of Scout. Uh, we're probably the newest space company here, but we are based uh, locally in Alexandria, Virginia. So as we become a more technologically advanced society, we become more and more reliant on satellites. Additionally, we anticipate the total number of operational satellites in orbit to go up tenfold in the next decade. Uh, there's a distinct knowledge for more, uh, there's a distinct need, excuse me, for more knowledge on satellite health with up to 50% of all satellite failures having no known cause. And as new industry verticals come online, uh, such as satellite servicing, there's an additional need for these satellites to be more aware of their immediate surroundings. Scout is working to close this data gap that exists and be the new eyes of the space industry. We're developing the capabilities for in-space inspection and de-risking the next generation of spaceflight by making spacecraft smarter with onboard space situational awareness solutions. The first step on this journey is our Scout Vision sensor suite that will enable small satellites to perform proximity operations, docking maneuvers for servicing, and allow for sea and avoid maneuvers to avoid uh, space debris and potentially threats. Scout Vision will also serve as the core technology for our eventual Scout Sat inspection satellites, which we anticipate deploying by 2024. And we recently announced uh, our first demonstration mission, launching to space in only a few months. We'll be releasing more information about the mission's specific operations soon, but I can say there will be many first ever things happening uh, during this mission. It will also show the viability of the Scout Vision system itself and keep us on track to get to market by early next year. So I thank you for having me today and I look forward to the rest of the panel. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, up next is Dylan Brown, um, who is an executive leader at OneWebs. Um, Dylan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eliad. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, and thank you for the for, thank you for Dan for the opening remarks. I, I thought that was very poignant to set the economic boundaries of, of what our current satellite space industry is and, and what it could look like in the future. And OneWeb is really a big part of that future, right? Um, so let's see. Uh, we're, we're based here in Fairfax County in Tyson's Corner. This is where we operate our satellites. We have a, a sister backup operation center in London, which is the picture behind me uh, with my backdrop here. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard about OneWeb, um, I'm hoping that's not many. Uh, we are a global satellite network operator. We provide satellite telecommunication services to governments, to enterprise partners, to communities uh, around the world. We start our services this fall uh, in Canada, Alaska, UK, and the Nordics. And then we, uh, in a phased approach, we, we, we roll that around the world. So we're starting early, early testing uh, and, and um, if you want like alpha and beta testing this this fall uh, of the summer and then fall and uh, we're excited to connect those folks that are unconnected. Um, I think later in the panel we'll talk a little bit more about the economic and, and technical challenges so I look forward to questions on that. Thank you Elia. Great, thank you Dylan. Next we'll have Brad Ghani who is a strategic development manager for Ball Aerospace. Brad the floor is yours. Good day everyone, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'm relatively new to the space industry. Uh, I would say it's been uh, just a share under two years, 
Uh, prior to that, I wrapped up about 25 years of service uh, in the Army, uh, where I was using technology to solve complex problems uh, for our uh, Special Operations Forces. Um, shortly thereafter, I had the opportunity to attend a space launch down at Cape Canaveral. We saw an advanced EHF communication satellite launch on an Atlas rocket, and I tell you what, that was one of those things that changed my life. Um, and, I, and I needed to get into the aerospace business. And so um, I was lucky enough to land here at Ball, where I think I probably have the best job in the world because uh, my, my leadership said, hey, whatever you can do to make Ball a better place. And so uh, for me internally, I get to network uh, and, and solve problems using Ball's technology that could be uh, on the directed energy side, it could be low observable technologies, it could be uh, space-based uh, situational awareness capabilities data analytics, AI, machine learning, all the way over to heliophysics um, and remote sensing that, that's making the world a safer place. So uh, I'm excited to interface with all of our customers and, and bring those requirements and, and capabilities uh, and match those up against our capabilities and uh, excited to talk about those things here today. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brad. Um, and finally, we have John Ellenberg. Chief Mission Architect uh, for Space Systems at Northrop Grumman. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everybody from California. I'm broadcasting from my office where I'm not allowed to have a camera. So you're all mercifully spared looking at me uh, this early in the morning. Uh, Northrop is a, a large traditional aerospace company and we build missions uh, across the spectrum for every kind of customer you can imagine. Uh, from science missions uh, like the James Webb Space Telescope, where I spent about 10 years finally being the chief engineer, uh, to uh, communication satellites, uh, servicing satellites, and uh, servicing other government customers. Uh, we are always looking for new technology and new services to provide uh, for our customers, uh, both nationally and globally. I'm very much looking forward uh, to this panel and the opportunity to uh, talk about the future, uh, because I like to say I'll agree with Brad, I also have the best job uh, in the universe, I get to invent tomorrow. So let's let's talk about that uh, as part of this great panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John. So just before we move to our next round of questions, I would like to remind all participants and attendees that you may, uh, you may uh, present questions uh, through the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen, and we'll collect them and try to answer some of them at the third section of this panel. Um, so we'll now go into our um, round one of open questions. Um, as indicated by Dan in the opening remarks, the global space economy size has risen to $366 billion as of October 2020 of which nearly a third is driven by government budgets. So my first question to Gil is, why is the space economy booming now? So thank you, Eliad, for the question. Um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a matter of a, a new approach now. I, I would call it democratizing, uh, democratizing space. Now, once it was just uh, governments who dealt with space. And now actually we have, uh, you know, a hype here. We got now billionaires and startup, uh, all of those giving uh, kind of a glory halo and a big of a startup hype into, into space. So lots of money is being spent there. Uh, people are sharing their childhood dreams, you know, uh, people like uh, Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos uh, saying how they dreamed about space when they were young and they're willing to put uh, billions of dollars into that. Uh, like Dan mentioned, we got tons of uh, satellites uh, being launched into space by companies like OneWeb, SpaceX, Amazon in future and, and others. So this is creates like a positive feedback circle. So private money, VC money is injected. A lot of companies put new technologies and new uh, concepts. This actually goes even circles go over to the government. The government sees that the uh, technology is good, that uh, actually costs are going down and uh, they can get the performance for lower. So people like the Space Force and the Space Development Agency actually now uh, are going to the commercial market and getting constellations. 
So this is like a very positive feedback circles that is going in this industry. Okay. Um, thank you, Gil. Eric, would you mind sharing with us your perspective on that question as well? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I think there's we're at an inflection point where there's a lot of convergence of enabling things. So one, you've got the miniaturization of technology, allowing a lot more capability to exist in smaller packages. You've got the decrease in costs of that same technology. I mean, I can go get a Raspberry Pi now for less than $30 that has more capabilities than anything 10 years ago. Well, that's a bit of a stretch, but you know what I mean. Um, you've also got uh, things like launch cost going down, like the per kilogram launch rate is the lowest it's, I think it's ever been and the launch capacity going up. So not only is it cheaper to go to space, but you can, you know, at least volume wise, send up a lot more stuff, uh, mass wise, excuse me, uh, send a lot more stuff up. Um, additionally, you've got the, the thought processes of the prototypical Silicon Valley startup permeating through the aerospace industry. So what was what once was a big multi-billion dollar project to get to space, um, you've now got rapid iteration uh, you know, producing things that might not be designed to survive, you know, three nines and 95 percent or whatever. Um, and so all of those things converge to allow much more enabling of technologies, concept and business models to be rapidly tested and iterated on uh, to see which ones are going to be more successful. And so I think there's just more of it happening because more of it can happen. Gotcha. Thank you, Eric. Um, Dylan, can you please tell us more about the commercial drivers for OneWeb's business model and if or how it relates to Dylan's and Eric's previous observations? Th thank you, Elliot. Yeah, I, was, I was really thinking about what Eric said in terms of the, the philosophy, right, the technical philosophy. Um, and I just wanted to come back on that. I, I, as we, you know, when we have 110 satellites up, we're launching at a, at a, at a more, more or less a monthly cadence, right? Um, one of the really important things for us is, is um, what we call responsible space, right? It is, is doing this in a way that is coordinated and we're building up space vehicles that have been thoroughly tested and that have redundancy and mechanisms for collision avoiders, uh, avoidance and so forth. Um, you know, we're at the cusp of a lot more satellites going into orbit, low earth orbit in particular. And, and I think we, it, it, it behooves us in these kind of fora to talk about that, right? So I think, I think that's really important. Um, in terms of economics, look, OneWeb is a, is a commercial satellite communications company. Um, and we're addressing multiple use cases around the world, many of which are traditional use cases. Folks on a cruise ship that want to connect to Wi-Fi or on an aircraft, um, government agencies, aid agencies who are deploying around the world in disaster relief, right? Um, but also even into rural communities that, that simply uh, are not getting the, the, you know, the contemporary internet experience, right? I mean, the internet is effectively a utility, right? So, so we have multiple use cases. What's different from the companies that have come before us in this last 50 years is we're using, it's, it's all about scale, right? We're using a lot more radio spectrum. We're deploying a lot more spectrum, which means more bits, right? More bits per Hertz, right? Uh, we're doing. We're building a network at scale. We're building satellites uh, in a very rapid cycle. We have a factory in in Florida, in Merritt Island. We produce two satellites a day. But by the way, we don't do that on our own. We have a huge supply chain behind us of traditional industry vendors. We have about thirty six vendors, um, and you know they're working flat out through COVID with us to to get this going. So so economically, it's about it's about scaling up um, and then offering our customers a better experience. Um, Hopefully, I've answered your question. You did. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, John, can you please tell us what new space means for you? And how do you see the standardization fitting into that? Sure. I'm, I'm sort of at the other end uh, of the scale uh, than my previous colleague. I, I tend to work on missions that are exquisite and one at a time. Uh, things like James Webb, uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and where we're looking to new space, and me in particular, is how uh, the types of supply chains and standardization that Dylan and other speakers have talked about uh, can help us uh, drive down the cost 
of, to develop these exquisite uh, systems. How much of the parts can be standardized so that the engineering is offloaded from the team and we can concentrate uh, essentially I, entirely on the performance of the payload, the telescope, uh, the science mission, the remote sensing, uh, the government payload. Uh, other trends like servicing, of which we are a leader, we're just about to make our second uh, commercial servicing rendezvous uh, later this month, uh, give the system designer like me a great number of tools to look at solving what would have been a previously very expensive problem in a more cost efficient manner. That's it. John? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, that was it. Good. Um, well, thank you, John. Um, Brad, as shown by Dan, we see an increase in the number of spacecraft launch in the last few years. A majority of them are commercial. If you had a crystal ball, um, is the future market in small sat, big sats, both, or not its satellites at all? Yeah, great question. And, and, and one I, I love to talk about around the office and one I love to read about um, in, in the press. Um, it, it's, 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 you know, up for debate right now, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of the hybrid space architecture. I think um, there's going to be missions where it's absolutely positively required um, to build a large single purpose thing with a huge aperture. You know, take James Webb or, or other um, great observatories, for example. Uh, where the physics dictate what the what the size and shape of that thing is going to be. But I also think we're going to see a, a ton of opportunities, uh, just like communications, where uh, in order to previously uh, reach previously unreachable areas, um, we're going to have to do things smaller. We're going to have to do things more efficiently, more effectively. We're going to want to fly smaller instruments in different orbits um, and, and distribute that data in, in ways that we just haven't been able to do before. So I, I think there's room out there. Um, for a, a bunch of different capabilities at a bunch of different unique orbits um, and, and different sizes. Thank you, Brad. Um, Gil, we see new companies and startups entering the space domain. Do you find it to contribute to the new commercials? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, we see a startup mentality starting to uh, infiltrate the, uh, the space uh, domain. So uh, when you look at startup mentality, it uh, can be a lot of things, but one of them, maybe one of uh, the major things is uh, you are allowing yourself to take some shortcuts. You don't necessarily adhere to all the legacy uh, space, let's say methodology. So you can uh, typically adopt some critical space design, good engineering practices, and you can relax on other things like uh, probably testing and, and some of the uh, production. Uh, you can do rapid iterations. So you can actually try things and see uh, if they work. And this is uh, probably, it's not, that it's not correct for every aspect of space, but definitely correct to the place where you have a lot of satellites which are at a low cost and the launch price has re been reduced as uh, was mentioned. So you can actually uh, just put in space things and, and test them. And we see people like SpaceX, for example, uh, doing that uh, quite a lot. Um, at least on the LEO missions, you can use common off the shelf for automotive parts and screen them for radiation and be able to get lower costs. And uh, all of those are things which are not, have not been part of legacy space, but uh, definitely things that uh, startup companies have introduced, especially on the low earth orbit. Gotcha. Thank you. Eric, can you share with us your thoughts about the role of private and venture capital within the space economy? Yeah, I think um, it, it kind of depends on which part of, of venture capital you're looking at, whether you're looking at, you know, pre-seed seed seed or things like Series A and beyond. And I think, you know, at least the large seed Series A is very well established in the space uh, economy and, and they they're doing a lot to um, help those companies transition from the startup phase to you know fully operational companies and, and we've seen a lot of those examples um, but I think earlier on in the phases uh, of development um, 
VC investors and all that uh, play a vital role alongside things like SBIRs in helping uh, and other government grants in helping companies figure out their technology and and uh, get it to market. Um, and so what you see is you know kind of the divergence in those things. Like you can use SBIRs to help develop your technology and de-risk it on the business side. And you can use the business side VC investors to help accelerate your ability to go to market. And I think those things work hand in hand quite frequently in the space industry to help these, uh, to help smaller companies uh, evolve and establish themselves. But I think it's crucial in the next few years that the um, earlier stage venture capital in the space industry increases. I think there's a disparity in, um, in where uh, investments are happening in the space industry, and, and it's much more lean towards the uh, later stage uh, startup rounds. And I think um, in order for a lot more newer companies to succeed, I think there needs to be a bit of a shift towards earlier stage seed, pre-seed uh, investments to uh, enable uh, more great technologies and companies to be uh, developed. Great. Thank you. So this is a question I'm going to feel to both John and Brad at the same time, and please feel free to take it the way you want. Um, in what way should Northrop or Ball evolve, if any, and what action do you take today to adjust to this changing, I would say, space economy? Let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead and then I'll let Brad uh, uh, either agree or disagree with me. I, I think that... Uh, uh, it's a misunderstanding that uh, large aerospace companies like Northrop, like Ball, like our, our competitive mates are big ponderous uh, uh, companies that lack innovation. Uh, we do innovate. We, we solve a very different problem than our colleagues like Eric and Dylan and Gil. We typically design one complicated system, make one or two. We don't design it once and make 100 copies. Now, certain of the missions that, that we do, do that allow us to, uh, to gain scale uh, are, are coming. Uh, a number of uh, science missions involve constellations uh, where we'll leverage that. Uh, but we have always been uh, uh, leaders in innovation within our own particular uh, engineering and economic sector. So I would say that we are doing it. Uh, what is new to us is the fact that we now have a, a, a larger number of competitors for things like the communications, uh, the space situational awareness uh, market, and some of the other markets that uh, we traditionally have held uh, by ourselves. Yeah, I, I don't think I disagree with any of that, John. All, all, all great points. Um, I, I would add that I, I think that the commercial space opportunities are driving some change and change and competition is good. Um, it, it tends to result in a better product uh, and usually a lower cost. Um, with, within Ball, new opportunities are, are definitely causing us to look at our business practices. Um, in a lot of cases, our acquisition timelines and our business development timelines are modeled after the government. Uh, those aren't always the fastest and they aren't always the most efficient processes. So. Um, it, it, is, it is driving us to, to be a better company, um, but that's also trickling down then to our partners, uh, suppliers, and, and teammates uh, across the board. Um, and, and just because it doesn't mean, it, just because it, it drives change in our processes, it, it, that all, also occurs um, you know, downstream as well. Um, and so that's caused us to exercise our supply chain and determine, hey, can you meet a fast moving requirement? How do we... Um, get ahead on long lead parts or, or things that aren't developed that, that need to be developed and and what can we standardize with regards to physical logical interfaces uh, software interfaces how can we make a thing that is in perhaps an 80 percent solution uh, for most problems that we just have to tweak a little bit and, and customize that for for each emerging opportunity so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there that's creating a bigger ecosystem for space rated parts um, and, and that's benefiting everybody uh, across the industry. Um, and we can collectively derive that to make a thriving commercial market that isn't reliant on the government. Uh, and I think that'll be better off for everyone. Great, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Brad. Dylan, 
what do you think is the advantage, if any, of younger companies in the current market? Yeah, I was just thinking about Brad said there. Um, so when we were building from scratch, right? We we have uh, currently have about 240 staff. We'll, we'll grow to almost 500 this year. Uh, those staff were hiring from traditional aerospace uh, sectors. Uh, some posts we were able to bring in from outside aerospace from such as the, the mobile telecom market, right? Um, particularly folks who are doing our, what we call our digital products, basically our subscription plans and services and the platforms that enable those, right? Um, so, so, so those folks come to the company and, you know, of course they, they're imprinted with the way industry has traditionally done things. So our job is to work with them and, and challenge them to come up with faster, better ways of doing it, right? And, and, and again, starting a business from a blank sheet of paper helps, right? In terms of practices, processes, and so forth. I, I'll give you an example. One of our biggest customers uh, will be the United States Space Force, right? United States Department of Defense. Um, I, I, you know, big customer for many of us here, right? Um, and, and, and quite rightly, you know, that customer set has a preoccupation with cybersecurity, information assurance, and so forth. So as, as a new company, when, when we get to talk about uh, NIST-based, uh, you know, quality assurance, cyber assurance, uh, and, and risk management frameworks, that's easy for us to implement because we were going to implement one anyway. So if that's the current one, we'll, we'll, we'll do it, right? Um, and, and as that evolves, we will evolve because we'll have built a system that enables us to, to, to do so. Um, I, I think that is the biggest advantage we have versus traditional industry, right? We, we, you know, when folks come in the door at OneWeb, when they do their onboarding, um, they're challenged to think differently and they're, and, you know, and they're expected to think differently, right? Well, thank you, Dylan. What I take from you is the flexibility of being a new company offers some advantages as you move forward. Um, okay, so this question concludes our round one uh, of questions. Uh, just as a reminder before we go into our round two of discussion that uh, you can post your questions on the Q&A box at the bottom and in the third section, we'll try to answer as much of those questions as we can. So round two would um, conduct a bit differently um, I guess maybe I should st just start by saying uh, that I thank you all for your insight. Uh, and as we move to the new discussion sec, uh, now we'll move to the discussion session where I'm asking our panel members to identify for us some key technological areas that in your opinion show the most promise, either financially or other. And I'm specifically interested to learn in what innovative ways your companies address these technological needs um, to all of our panel members, this is an open question. Uh, we're going to start with Brad just for the sake of having someone to start with, but then feel free to follow up. This is an open discussion. Man, it, uh, things I'm excited about at Ball is, is a tough one because I, I wake up every day thinking about this stuff and sometimes I, I lay in bed thinking about it. it um, I, I, I just feel lucky to be surrounded by all, all this cool stuff here. I, I'll tell you a couple things that that really um, I think have a bright future. One is, is onboard processing. Um, the idea that we can process that data on the collection platform um, and then downlink the data that we need to in a timely fashion um, through, through new space architectures, not reliant on, um, on a couple of ground entry points is really exciting. Um, you know, that's, that's information that could be helpful for, for anything to the user in, in the remote sensing standpoint. It could be something like a fast moving forest fire it could be a flood or some other kind of weather event. Um, it, on the defense side, it could be a, a group of fast moving enemy ships in the ocean, but timely access to that data through onboard processing uh, is pretty exciting. I also think there's a bright future for um, open architecture and, and software defined systems. You know, I'm, I, I have a telecommunications background at, at some point in my past, and, and I really would like to see the space industries through some of the government customers. I think they're driving more of a mobile device model market out there. And what I mean by that is if we could refresh our on-orbit technology every 24 months with a new thing, um, that, that would be fantastic. That way we're not waiting five to 10 years. If we could launch uh, a, a new something like this that is, you know, I get a new one of these every two years from, from my cell phone company. And it's, it's mostly the same size. It's mostly the same shape, but it has a better screen. It has a better camera. It can it can download faster data and it can play better games. And all that stuff is driven by the software architecture 
of that ecosystem that's out there. So I think once we have that infrastructure in place on the hardware side and, and, and the software driven systems, new capabilities are, are gonna be available much more rapidly. We're, we, if we're gonna take advantage of a new sensor that's on orbit, we're gonna write an app uh, that's gonna do those sort of things and provide new capabilities to users. And, and there's gonna be a commercial market for things like that that we're seeing already with, with remote sensing and, and commercial SAR and, and things like that. I think space domain awareness is pretty exciting too, um, because it has to be, it has to be important. We can't create a, a giant debris field um, surrounding the earth. And you know, there's, there's recent studies that came out that highlight the, the top 10 things that are, are threatening all other satellites. And if any of these old rocket bodies or, or things that we weren't careful about in the past, if any of those collide, uh, it's gonna make life a lot more difficult for, for all of us in this business. And so we're excited to be part of programs like uh, the Air, Air Space Force's uh, Space-Based Space Surveillance just uh, uh, celebrated its 10 year anniversary. Uh, and that's a system in space whose job it is, is to keep track of other things in space. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's ground-based companies that are contributing to uh, observing things in orbit and, and predicting where they go. Um, so I, I think those are all exciting technologies. Um, lastly, I, I, wanna, I wanna hit on AR VR because I'm a huge fan of that sort of stuff. Um, having been a, a ground combat commander, you know, one of the things that's really important to me was understanding where my friendly forces were and where all the other forces on the battlefield were. And I, I think as we look at space and as we look at that information environment and the, the situational awareness that's up there, I can't help but think that AR and VR have opportunities to provide us with access to data and ways to understand data that we don't currently have. And, and being able to visualize what's out there, what's here and what's there, and where is it going to be at tomorrow, and where is it going to be at next week, and, and trying to understand uh, that highly complex environment. I, I think those are all, all things that are going to be pretty exciting. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, just to kind of tie into your first comment about the cycle of refreshing technologies on spacecraft, let me throw you a nugget. Uh, the Perseverance rover that is going to land on February 18th, hopefully, um, has a, an onboard processing system made at 1998. Kid you not. And each one of your cell phones is probably about an order to two orders of magnitude faster than that. So yeah, I, I, I'll cheer for that. Higher refreshing rate of technologies as we go. Of course, it's a bit more complicated. I'm kind of um, exemplifying this. Um, there are radiation requirements and other requirements. Not all technologies are equal, but, but thank you. OK, who wants to go next? Let me, let me chime in into what Brad said uh, about refresh, about him you know, putting his cell phone up and saying, and I think there, uh, he mentioned software, but uh, one critical thing is the hardware. And it's a company who is actually developing ASICs. So the uh, silicon process is critical. So one of the things that really enables us to get a, in the same size, and which looks just about the same, but much better processing and so on, is actually you know, Moore's law, that every two years we, we kind of duplicate the, uh, the processing power and uh, half the, um, the, the uh, power consumption. So what typically happened in space is because of things that were mentioned, radiation and uh, the time it takes to develop a spacecraft, which uh, was pretty long. What happened is that uh, people leaned on, on the older technologies, uh, older technologies meaning less performance, more power. And what is happening now with companies uh, which are uh, developing uh, chips uh, like Satisfy is that we are actually going instead of uh, going backwards and taking a safe approach on something which is you know like you said 10 years old we are going to the edge of technology in in silicon or almost to the edge and uh, and building things uh, over there so uh, the processes nodes are in the uh, in the nanometers the small nanometers it can be uh, 20 12 even 7 and they're still pretty good in, in radiation hardening in general, and especially in the low Earth orbit. So this is something very interesting that happens. And the gain in, in performance is, is huge. Uh, and um, another thing which uh, Brad said, which uh, caught my, uh, my, my uh, attention, is he mentioned the onboard processing. So onboard processing is, again, affected by what you can do uh, in the processor. 
So uh, developing technologies like regenerative processing, uh, I'm, I'm more inclined towards communications, but uh, things that can actually direct the capacity on demand. So uh, somebody like OneWeb uh, want to provide the best communication services to their customers. So they actually would uh, enjoy a technology which enable their customers to get exactly what they need and in time, uh, which is something which was not uh, not available before. It was kind of a big, a big uh, spread of uh, of communication uh, statistically multiplexed. Uh, so this is something which is very interesting. Or the new technologies of uh, beam forming and, uh, and putting multiple beams directly to the uh, to the subscribers. Those are things which has been in existence for many years in the past, uh, mostly on government military radar, but they were not capable of really being put on satellites because of power consumption, because of cost. And uh, now the technology has gotten to a, to a let's say, uh, an air time uh, that uh, you can actually build things very cheaply and have a tremendous capacity. So you can do some other things like direct to sell, you know, like small satellite, which will transmit directly to your cell phone. Do uh, amazing things on earth sensing and observation, uh, like uh, was mentioned, SAR and uh, sensing of radio waves, of uh, um, molecules, many other things. And of course, uh, broadband uh, communications. Thank you, Gil. So I guess I'll jump in next. Um, I'm going to go a little bit higher level, and I'm going to say what excites me the most is the in-space capabilities that are developing. So um, you've got things like in-space manufacturing that you can make larger structures in space. You've got satellite servicers. I mean, Northrop Grumman's doing a ton in this, and uh, you know I think Ball provides a lot of uh, components for this as well and subsystems, but uh, things like satellite repair, satellite movement, satellite uh, life extension, all those sorts of things. And that enable a lot more business cases. And then you've got, um, I guess, mobility solution providers, you know, Momentus and other space tugs. Um, there's a lot of things that can be enabled by these technologies, uh, including, you know, and on a different kind of vertical uh, commercial space stations that'll be coming on board. There's a lot of in space things around the corner that are really exciting. And, you know, the advertisement here is that Scout fits into this equation fairly nicely because uh, almost all of these uh, verticals, all of these companies need some vision solutions for different reasons. Um, and we're, we're working to kind of provide that capability. So like I kind of teased the, uh, the Scout Vision Centers we were developing earlier, which provides you know, stereoscopic visible spectrum imagery and some other fun stuff that um, can allow depth perception and things like that. So you can do things like inspections, which is what we're working to in our long-term vision. Um, you can do things like scene avoid maneuvers, proximity operations, docking, and things like that. So there's a lot of different verticals in the industry that we're able to contribute to. Uh, we hope to be able to co contribute to, um, and that what those companies will do with their capabilities and combine with others' capabilities, I think, is going to provide for a lot of exciting things happening in space uh, in in the next few years. Yeah, I got to agree with Eric, you know, Sirius XM had that failure recently, it would be awesome to be able to get a look at, at what happened up there and, and, and think about uh, how to make that better, what's, what's salvageable, what's not. Um, but, you know, there's interesting second and third order effects for things like the insurance market that are, that are going to uh, take into play there. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on, on two threads, one that, that Eliad laid down and follow up with uh, Eric. Uh, Eliad did uh, hit on something, whether he knew it or not, uh, in talking about the Mars rover, uh, one of the things that drives, uh, ex I'll call it exquisite system design, things like a Mars rover, a James Webb, uh, other important singular assets, is determinism in performance, right? The one thing that our customers, uh, having survived a number of these design reviews, uh, one thing customers don't like to hear is maybe. They want to know that the system is going to work and it's going to, and that we have complete control and understanding of how the system behaves. And so this, this requires us to use well-defined, extremely well-understood uh, technologies. It's not like 
any of, of the system designers like using things that are 15 or 20 years old or slower computers. It is uh, a necessary aspect of, of the business. Now, if we had on-orbit servicing so that we could move away from a paradigm of absolute reliability of a system to availability, including repair and restoration, uh, this, as they say, changes everything. Uh, it would change the design paradigms, it would change the testing and the development timelines, and these exquisite missions, like the smaller systems, can come out at a faster cadence. So we can begin to approach uh, the types of systems that Brad was talking about uh, for the exquisite customer market, and that is what is truly exciting to me as a as a senior engineer and will keep me at work for, uh, I hope, decades to come to build some of these fabulous instruments, including uh, what I will call the availability paradigm or what I'm calling the new space uh, for large systems. And so that is particularly exciting. And of course, uh, I'm absolutely thrilled that my com company is, is a leader along with our, uh, our colleagues across the industry. Uh, maybe I can wrap that one up, Eliad, very quickly. So from OneWeb's perspective, there are two things that are important here in terms of our vision and, and excitement for the future, right? So number one, we want to deliver better communication services to our uh, wholesale partners, right? We don't, we don't sell directly to customers. We sell through partners. We're, we're an enabler. Uh, and as I said previously, this is a traditional industry that's been around for some 40 plus years. Uh, we feel that it's tremendously inefficient. Uh, the customer is often paying more for what they don't necessarily need. So we're bringing economic uh, and technical prowess in, in, you know, into that space. And I think that isn't, you know, put, put my previous put my co-panelist here, you know, that in itself isn't a material thing. That's, that's, a, that's a logical thing, right? Um, second point, uh, um, and, and one that's been cited in the, in the media on, on this one, which is position, navigation, and timing. Uh, the world this, this Zoom call is, is, is dependent on GPS, right? Um, if it wasn't for GPS, we wouldn't be doing this Zoom call, right? And, 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 and everything from the power that comes into our homes, the signals on our cell phones, everything is slave to a timing signal. And we've built a world that's slave to the GNSS systems that, 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 um, that you know, our, our, our nations effectively operate, right? GNSS signals are basically operated by nations. So it turns out there's a there's a there's an alternate, right? Uh, it doesn't replace it; it augments it. And 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 OneWeb's technical team are spending a tremendous amount of effort um, finding a solution in our first generation, which is the satellite you see behind me, uh, which we're fielding now. We have 110 of those in space, uh, and then we will have future blocks, future generations with with enhancements of that. I, I think PNT is a critical uh, discussion thread, and and frankly, our our customers are not putting enough of a focus on it and budget behind it. Um, so, so here we are in industry leaning forward. Right? Thank you, Dylan. Well, this was a great session. Thank you all for your insight. We are now moving into our third session where we take audience questions and maybe share some final thoughts. Um, Asher, I would let you moderate the questions. Uh, panel members, please feel free to chime in on answering the questions that come up. Um, I'll let you go, Asher. Yes, uh, thank you everyone for the great discussions. Uh, so we have a few questions. I'm going to read them from the chat. Uh, and Elliot, maybe you'll help to direct which one can answer the question. So the first one, does the panel feel, or I would say think, that satellite networks can effectively and sustainably compete with terrestrial networks, especially over large population uh, concentration, or does it see SETCOM as a niche to market segments such as Aero and Marine Time. Any panel question. members that is interested? Dylan, I, I, Yeah, I, I guess that one's for me. And that's a great question. Thank you to whoever posted that. Um, satellites have always been an augmentation to terrestrial communications. Uh, you know, thankfully 5G is rolling out and affording better experience to, to folks in, 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 in urban and rural areas but there will always be those use cases that fall outside that gap. Um, yes, maritime and aviation, of course, but, but, but there are others too, right? Um, as we discussed, rural communities, 
um, aid agencies that deploy, um, you know, fishery fleets. Uh, connectivity is the basis of economy, and there are many, many use cases that we're addressing. Uh, I, I maybe point out one detail, which is important. Direct to consumer satellite broadband is a very different market from, from um, what OneWeb is providing, which is an enterprise grade solution. Again, we enable our partners to connect their customers. So if you take the example of shipping that was cited, it's not about just folks chatting on WhatsApp to their family, that is essential. But what's become equally essential is the maintenance of the engine on that ship, the navigation systems on that ship, uh, et cetera. And so there's tremendous economic value in those things having an IoT-like connectivity solution. So, so the use cases are very broad beyond uh, you know, consumer broadband. Gotcha. Thank you, Dylan. Anyone else from the panel wants to respond? Okay, let's move to our next question then, Asha. I have actually a follow-up question for that. What do you guys think about the network of small satellite, thousand of them that Google and Amazon are building to provide the internet connectivity to a different part of the world? I read about it about maybe six months ago. Anyone want to take it? Uh, sorry, I don't want to hog, but Google, Amazon, yes, uh, both have been in and out of the sat small satellite world. Amazon, Kuiper is back in. The FCC have granted them uh, a license recently. Um, you know, I I've read the Amazon book like the rest of you have. They do things in seven-year cycles, right? So <laughs> we'll see what happens in seven years. Meanwhile, one web is offering service this year, right? So. Gotcha. Eric, you're smiling. I feel like you want to say something. <laughs> no? Okay, gotcha. Asha, let's jump to the next question. Okay, next one is uh, the topic of debris. We have so many satellite, uh, military, uh, commercial. What about debris that's happening in space? What's, what do you think they're worried about that? And if anything can be done about that? I think I'll, I'll jump in. Um, for anything that is newly going up, it's about following good practices and living up to things like the, the Outer Space Treaty and things like that, and uh, new requirements that are coming on board for, for deorbiting in a certain amount of times and stuff like that. For stuff that is already in orbit, um, you know, there's a lot of companies coming online to try to tackle that. Um, there's companies looking to clean up space, be the, the, the trash collectors of space and all of that. Um, space debris is going to be a problem. It's gonna probably get a lot worse before it gets a lot better. Um, but it's, it's a matter of one finding financial models that work for allowing companies to be able to do this because, um, it's tough to financially justify just going up and cleaning space, uh, but it's vital to the space industry. So figuring out what that angle is that works, um, but, you know, developing the capabilities to be able to do that to, for debris mitigation, for debris cleanup, um, and all that uh, is also essential and companies are working on that and we're kind of plugging into that in some sort of way. Um, you know, once we get to the inspection part, that'll also be pretty useful for uh, determining maybe what is space debris or what might become space debris. Um, and so I, it's a very multi-legged problem, uh, but I think industry working together on it can probably come up with a solution. I'm not sure what, if there is like a silver bullet uh, yet though. Yeah, so I, just, maybe I, just, uh, Asha, I want to follow up on, on this topic and say that um, it, it's actually becoming an issue in many activities that I'm taking part of when designing new space missions. I can tell you that in some cases, we just avoid some regions around the Earth, let's say up to 1,200 kilometers, just to avoid the density um, of, of those debris. And then on top of that, in some cases, we introduce um, auto navigation systems, right, to avoid collisions not just with debris, but also with space staff that are not well managed or well behaved, let's put it this way. Um, so I, it's kind of weird to me that I see on the one hand, we acknowledge the problem. On the other hand, we're trying to avoid it by redesigning our specs to not meet that problem. So yeah, I do think it's that already, the end, need to be a solution. Okay. Way it's already a risk yeah. to human life. You know, we, we have times where we have to move the ISS or the astronauts in the ISS have to uh, shelter in, in a Soyuz capsule um, to avoid space debris. So, you know, I, 
other than human life, I, I don't, you know, maybe it's financial incentive, maybe it's loss of capability. There's, there's got to be something else that we collectively as an industry uh, and our governments figure out that has to incentivize that. And, you know, that's kind of an artificial market right now that maybe needs to be jump-started by the government to start paying for those things. Um, it's going to have to be something that everybody contributes to for, for the good of, of all of us. John, you want to say something? Yeah, I think uh, you hit on a, uh, an interesting part of this discussion that we haven't talked about, and that's the, I'll call it the regulatory or perhaps the transnational regulatory issue. I mean, this is a common problem faced by everybody, regardless of your space mission. And I'll call it, uh, you know, there's nobody paying for it because there's no fees, there's no cost, there's no, uh, you're, you're free to pollute up until you ruin the space environment for everybody. And uh, this is a, a challenge uh, for folks like the AIAA and other professional associations, uh, you know, the International Telecommunic, you know, Satellite Telecommunic, ah, I need more coffee. The International Satellite Telecommunication, Telecommunications Union or whatever mythical uh, super organizations you can think of uh, to establish things like uh, a fee or a tax that would pay for this utility for everybody. And so as the economy develops, there needs to be some rules for cooperation. Uh, and this is probably at the national or the international level, uh, but there's a definite significant regulatory aspect. Uh, and I don't wanna use the, the evil word taxation or fee-based uh, access, but right now nobody pays a fee for maintaining the environment in space. And uh, to be quite honest, if uh, if everybody puts up a, a gazillion low Earth orbiting satellites and puts an impenetrable shield of crud around the planet, I can't get my next generation space telescope to L2. So I think this is a this is a serious challenge for the community, the American community, the international community, uh, and needs to be faced up before it becomes a crisis. If I can jump in, uh, Elliot, T two things have happened this last week, right? Um, first of all, SpaceX launched 180, 148 small satellites, right? Some of which have got excellent scientific uh, heritage and pedigree, some of which are just CubeSats, right? Um, and, and one could say, well, from my own perspective, we're up at 1,200 kilometers. That's not our problem. It is our problem because it's bad practice, right? Second thing that happened this last week, uh, our, our industry brethren in Europe launched a satellite straight into our orbital plane, and they did not tell us, right? That was licensed under, under the uh, authority of Sweden. Um, we immediately reached out to the US uh, Air Space Force for tracking. We issue all our data. We, we, wanted to, we didn't know whose it was, and we didn't know what it was doing there. And there was potentially a conjunction, right, in, in our orbital plane. And, and I mean, it begs the question, how would you not tell your neighbors that you're about to turn up in, the, in their neighborhood, right? Uh, so so the, two things, regulatory, yes, but responsibility. You know, wh wh whether it's the scientific community, whether it's the, the if you will, the for-profit community, we, 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 we are bound to, and, and it isn't very hard to communicate. Look at us all here on this, on this link, right? We're, we're all available to talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I can, before I go to the next question, just lay one more comment to that because it's so important. Uh, maybe the World Trade Organization, that model when nation and private company launch items to space, need to give some funding for to put our contra a contract to take down those, maybe with laser, I don't know, those debris, the way we do recycle everywhere. Maybe that should be the model in the future because that's things happening. But I have another exciting question from somebody, a young person in the crowd, in the audience. What is the message for young people, high school or student, from your perspective, Brad, you said it's a great career, for young people that want to inspire to go to space, to be part of the industry, to be maybe part of NASA, what's your message for them? Well, I'll let some of our um, participants answer first and I'll, I'll take it at the end. I can say I can say you know as, as usual uh, you know concentrate on your STEM uh, 
STEM studies and uh, the STEM, you know, is a basic for any engineering, any um, scientific uh, uh, foundation that is required in this field. And uh, once, once you uh, feel comfortable there, then uh, you can always try and find some kind of an internship in, uh, in one of the uh, companies here, either a small company or, or a large company and get established in this field. Thank you, Gil. So, Anyone from the panel members? Eric? Yeah, uh, uh, not to disagree, but I'm gonna go a slightly different way and say that um, the industry has a lot of engineers um, and STEM is important. Kids, you know, take your science classes, but you know, we need a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds to make this industry happen. Um, as we develop more capabilities, we're not just going to need satellite engineers. We're going to need artists, business people, people that can manage in-space hotels. Like there are a lot of jobs that are going to be happening that aren't your core aerospace engineering things. And we're already seeing shortages in people willing to do some of those jobs now. So you out there have a skill, you can use it. It doesn't have to be engineering. Engineering's good. I have an engineering background, like it's awesome. But if you're not an engineer, that doesn't mean you can't be in the industry. There are so many opportunities that currently exist and that will exist. And I would say, while you're still in school, get involved in networking, like organizations, uh, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, SEDS, uh, operates at the high school and college level. They have an international network. They're a great way to get into the industry. Um, and again, if you are not an engineer, you can still provide tremendous value to the industry. So use your skills, use what you're good at, and find a way to use that to impact the industry. My liberal so, degree and I completely agree with you. <laughs> so just, uh, we have two minutes left, Ashel. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to answer on my side, and then we're going to conclude the panel, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, so I, I guess the way I see it is, the first thing you need to do is to follow your passion. Leave aside space, no space, just find that thing that you're passionate about, right? For me, it's space exploration. So I dedicated my life and career for it. Um, for other people, it could be art, but that does not mean it does not touch space industry, right? Um, so when you're established, when you know what your passion is, what you can put your energy into, then comes an array of opportunities. And this is where I'll be a bit practical so I can answer something that is not kind of up in the air. Uh, we have um, a website at NASA called OSSI that uh, enable opportunities for students, uh, young people, anywhere from high school through undergraduate uh, and graduate school to apply for internships. Uh, and NASA provides thousands, if not more, of internships, depends on the season and the month, uh, for people to come in and join. And we have internships that range anywhere from communication, to engineering, to science, to economics. Um, and that's, that's the critical thing I can put my finger on and just kind of open the door for the people who are interested. Uh, so I'm just repeating the name. It's OSSI, just search it on Google and you'll find it. So we have one minute left, so I'm going to conclude. Uh, we open this panel with a vibrant discussion about some of the financial drivers that bring into the space industry some of the most innovative companies and products we followed up with a discussion identifying some key technological areas and challenges, as well as the innovative ways companies deploy to address them and finalize with some audience questions and final, and final thoughts. I would like to, to thank Brad, Eric, Gil, Dylan, and John for their time and insight. It was a pleasure to have you all here today. I would like to thank again the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority for their, in uh, for their invitation and I'm excited to listen to our next keynote address by Kathleen Leaders, the Associate Administrator for Human Space Exploration. Back to you, Asher, and thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I appreciate the discussion. It was really uh, amazing, and I'll, I'll have some uh, additional thought about that. Uh, thank you, Eliad, and the panel members uh, for bringing your ideas and concept and some uh, some new uh, question as we move forward on that space. Before we move to the next keynote speakers, Catherine, I would like to show you kind of a cherry on the ice cream, a very nice uh, video that NASA has prepared for us. Heather, please run the video.
Ignition sequence start. Roger, right. All engines are running. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this dictator's out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking. One small step for man. And left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. The dawn of Orion. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of giants to go farther than humanity has ever been, we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. Well, that was a great, great uh, break and a great video. Uh, I have a great pleasure now to uh, introduce our closing address today, where we will learn about NASA take on the future of space exploration. Please welcome Ms. Katrin Leaders. Katrin served as NASA Associate Administrator of the Human Exploration and Operation Mission Directorate. Prior to her current role, Ms. Leader managed the agency commercial crew program, directing NASA effort to send astronauts to space on private spacecraft. Indeed, in May 2020, just last year, it was culminated in the successful launch and the safe splashdown in August 2020 of Demo 2 from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Ketchum began her long NASA career in 1992 at the White Sanders Test Facility in New Mexico. She later moved to the International Space Station program and served as the Transportation Integration Manager. And she has oversight international partner spacecraft visiting the space station. Catherine, with a great pleasure, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, why don't we advance to the next slide? Thank you. So I, I really I caught the uh, the panel, and um, you know what I really liked is the conversation kind of helped set up the, this discussion that I'm going to be having because one of our big challenges are how to involve everybody into the vision for space exploration. Um, it, what particularly resonated with me is it's not just engineers. We are going to need all kinds of people to be able to do the things that we want to do. And so what we're hoping is, is that we, and this is one more effort, and, and I'm hoping to kind of co-opt and have you all become missionaries for us, <laughs> for, you know, for this vision that this is for all of us. Um, and um, not just NASA's vision, but all of our vision for space exploration. It's a global vision. Next slide. So, you know, people talk a lot about what's different, what's different about how we're going to the moon. You know, when we, in the video you saw, hey, this is 60 years, but we're just beginning. And, and I think um, 
the just beginning means this is about us doing this with a team and not just one, one mission, but multiple missions to enable us to be able to accomplish our goals. We right now, and we realize that, you know, for us to be able to successfully do the hard missions on going to the moon and going to Mars, we've learned a lot in low earth orbit. And what we're hoping, and we're working with companies, and as we, you know, we talked a little bit about my career, we've been handing over cargo, first cargo delivery to the International Space Station to commercial providers. And then just started with crews handing that over. And we're hoping that this is then going to kind of kick off a, a activity and of people then more and more eventually moving towards having Leo free flyers in, in lower earth. Um, and, and that then is a capability that we can use to be able to study humans and do our research in a low earth platform without us ourselves retaining it. And I can just buy that as a service. What that then allows us to do is to then go work on studying around our lunar platforms, which is with our gateway system, our lunar orbiting platform that we have, and then beginning to work on surface activities that we have going on. We are doing this in a way that's not just about NASA going, but about us working with different companies, different international partners, and having that be a, a and doing it in a way that allows us to have our mission maybe be a multiplier for other missions and other economic benefits that can come out of it. And all of this is really then getting us ready for moving towards even going even farther. And a major activity we talk about first bots, then boots. <laughs> and and the, this robotic, uh, and in fact, we're getting ready to have a, on February 18th, our Perseverance, um, we have the Perseverance launch and that mission is actually going to be doing their their landing on mars and that's we that's the kind of the precursor for us to continue to learn about the environment that's there so that it can get ready for us to be able to learn enough to go figure out how would we then be able to go do a mars mission these these bots are kind of like our our um the, the folks that we kind of send out when we were doing our exploration in the beginning of this country, these bots are kind of the, the they're the scouts. They're out there trying to collect data on, on what are the things we've got to be ready for and looking for to be able to do our mission successfully. Next slide. So what I love about this picture is it's, it's a, uh, it's a montage of our current reality and our future goals, right? And so, you know, we've, we've looked at all the different ways that we can be able to collaborate with industry and kind of pursue economic goals with each one of our missions. So like I talked about, I talked about us handing over um, transportation for cargo and crew to the International Space Station. But honestly, 40 years ago, the government was doing launches on its own. Now we acquire launch services. That, that, that's been a huge uh, step forward in, in how we're acquiring services. It's not us doing it anymore. That actually us doing launch services for our science missions our critical science mission was kind of the first step towards us moving and beginning to do more commercial activities and kind of handing over to our commercial partners what were normally a government responsibility. Um, you know, we, we are using these partnerships with all the different companies that we work for to be able to kind of move and, and uh, demonstrate different technologies that then we can have available for um, industry too, to partner with us about doing it differently. And so right now we are obviously working with different companies on evolving our life support systems. And, and um, 
and working collaborations between upgrading our EVA suit capabilities and coming up with new ways to be able to replace problematic suit components that we're having and be able to provide that to folks so that maybe there could be commercial EVA suit uh, providers out there that could couple with commercial companies that want to be able to provide you know, new experiences um, for commercial passengers in low Earth orbit. SpaceX folks just, you know, I um, announced this week that they're doing their first free flyer mission. A uh, couple weeks ago, Axiom announced they're doing their first private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. These are all things that we're trying to do to infuse investment into our industry and allowing people to be able to come up with new ideas for to be able to use the the platforms that we've kind of initially that the nation's invested in and further find economic value from them. We continue to use try to use the brain power that's out there with our hard problems because I, I firmly believe we've got to use the problems we have as ways to be able to infuse knowledge and technology and vast and, and advancements within our, our industry um, and to use it as a tool for this nation's economic development. And so us putting big problems out there and getting people to think about it in, in multiple different industries, it's always interesting to me to, to see you'll have the PhD working on a problem, but you also have a school teacher or you'll have somebody else that's all in all those different perspectives help blend and, and, and give us that, that brain power to be able to have multiple people recognizing the problems that we have so they can start helping us with them. Next slide. So I'm a firm believer that exploration is a team sport. You know, we're starting, and I talk about this a lot, about um, we are trying to lay out our big problems and asking for multiple um, inputs to be able to solve those problems. Right now, and, and what that does is it sometimes it doesn't make it easier. It's always easier and, and we've all experienced it where, hey, if I could just control all the aspects of this, I would, you know, it would make things easier for me. But what, what it doesn't do is allow the aperture to be open and for there to be multiple solutions out there. And so, um, what we've learned is you, we want to lay a framework for our key platforms. So we have a low earth platform, obviously right now with the International Space Station. And we would like that platform, we'd like in the future to be able to buy services from a future commercial LEO platform. We feel like that's very, very important for us to be able to. We are working on a, a lunar orbiting platform that, that we already have international partner participants working with us and are really out there trying to now find and we already have our initial science uh, payloads up there and other science and research participants there. And we are in the process right now of working on our both our international partner and and commercial partners for the for the lunar surface. We feel like if we can get as many parts of industry, academia, um, science research. It's about us being NASA being an economic multiplier. You know, the for the, the approximately $20 billion that the nation spends, we want to be a hundred billion dollars worth of value. And so our goal is to continue to find new teams to be able to allow us to continue to be a multiplier. Sometimes us just having a hard problem means that we can't just solve it ourselves. So we will need international partners. We will need academia. We will need industry to all be working together for us to be able to, to solve the problem of how we're going to live and work on the lunar surface to get us ready to be able to go to Mars. Next slide. So here's our near-term exploration plans. You know, we are working towards really leveraging, we have commercial lunar payload services. It's a kind of a unique way for us to be able to buy payloads to, to the land on the moon. And we've got our initial payloads coming up 
that will be um, landing there over this next nine months. Um, first round, another another bot that I have out there that's that's going to help us get ready for the boots on the moon. Um, and we've got a couple companies that are out there. They actually are working their own landers, um, and and these we can do have. Um, contracts for different amounts of payloads. And it allows us then to be able to buy these small services to the lunar surface. It's another way where we're not, we're, we're trying to think of ways to infuse as many different companies as possible so that we can then be able to, through our need to be able to have robotic missions to the moon, be able to also infuse capital and capability into these companies. We are in the process of going through our last hot fire test on the core stage. And that's a, the remaining piece of the rocket that needs to go down to KSC to be assembled um, for us to do our uncrewed demonstration mission, hopefully by the end of this calendar year. Um, this is gonna be a big deal. People don't realize, yes, it's an uncrewed demo mission. I don't have crew on this, on this um, mission, but this is a mission that's going to go farther than any of the Apollo missions gone, 45,000 miles on the far side of the moon, four to six week mission, just a tremendous, tremendous mission. We will be going farther on this mission. And, and the reason we're doing that is because we really want to check out this system, really exercise these systems, because the next one is going to be our Artemis II mission. And it's going to be where those missions are going to actually fly crew to the far side of the moon and be checking out not only the rocket, not only the spacecraft, the Orion spacecraft, but also all of the communication systems, everything else that we have and our, our total um, mission operations teams that are needed to be able to conduct these missions safely. You know, I've talked a lot about the lunar orbiting platform, our gateway platform is, you know, the, the core piece of it, the HALO and PPE, our Northrop Grumman and Maxar um, contributions. And then we have the Europeans are providing our IHAP and our Spree. And we have the Japanese and the Canadians are providing key aspects. Obviously the Canadian robotic capabilities come in and to help us just like they did on the International Space Station. And well, having that is then as part of um, then getting us ready for our human landing system support that we're gonna be getting ready to um, announce our win, our the awardees for us funding the demonstration missions for our human landing systems. So we're just setting up for all the key aspects of the missions that we have coming up for us to do our exploration. Next slide. Our partnerships are obviously a big chunk of this. I've talked a lot about, we aren't doing this alone. We wanna do it with our international partners. We also view that this is a leverage for them too, trying to keep us all going on a peaceful endeavor for our overall economic value. Next slide. So I wanted to let you guys know how much of an impact the local, your local state has too. It's always important. I don't think people realize and we talk a lot about, uh, you know, NASA isn't just the NASA centers. NASA is has imp economic impact across all multiple states out there. And um, uh, want you to have this in slide of how valuable it is and the work that we're doing. Obviously, Langley is a huge contribution for, but but not only that, all the businesses and the other key aspects of it that are contributions for your state here. So I really, so I really, really appreciate you giving me this opportunity to be able to come in and talk to y'all. Um, I resonate with the fact that each one of us, I'm hoping each one of us are space geeks. You know, we're trying to figure out a way that you don't have to be an engineer, you don't have to be a scientist. We actually need each one of us because what we're trying to do was, is we're trying to cre create where we have a benefit to every single person in this nation through what we are doing in space. So thank you very much. Well, Catherine, thank you very much. Very inspiring presentation. I think it showed that NASA leadership role, not just in the US, but of course, globally, 
but beyond it, I think America is a continue to have opportunity to show a global leadership, global vision that not just bring uh, benefits for humanity, but actually bring economic development for us here uh, regionally as well. So we appreciate your presentation. We appreciate your contribution. This brings us to our end of our formal uh, programming for a uh, today program. Uh, we have now opportunity for about 25 minutes uh, or more to do networking on the Hoover platform. You are please uh, uh, invited to, to uh, migrate to that uh, uh, platform and go to the community area where we have a chat room that you can uh, interact with the speakers uh, of today's program via video. Uh, I would just remind that next week, we are journeying into defense and innovation in air. I think it will be exciting to see, uh, to see uh, what companies in Northern Virginia are doing when to that space. We have uh, US, we have uh, Israeli, with American companies. So that should be exciting as well. And I encourage everyone to uh, register for that uh, date as well. So lastly, I much appreciate all the speakers of today, all the team, of the EDA and DCI that's supporting us with this production. Uh, we really appreciate it. I hope everyone enjoyed the program. Happy networking and let's have a positive day. Thank you very much. <laughs>